So we will, uh, you know, we'll put a library that will be involved and, and it will be publicized throughout. Uh, but just so this talk, uh, American Dreams, how baby boomers change America, change the United States. I will give H.W. Brands, one of my favorite historians and current writers of history, credit. He's got a book by the name American Dreams, which talks about America from 1945 to present day. So if I was still in college, I might be blamed for plagiarism, but because I love it, H.W. Brands so much and kind of the same topic, I, I stole that title. So the term American Dream actually originated in 1931. Uh, there is a historian by the name of James Adams, who in his 1931 book, Epic of America, talks about the American dream. And now the term had been used in the previous century. And think about it, when we talk about the American dream, what, who are we talking about? Uh, or what, which citizens do we normally say, hey, the American dream. I've achieved the American dream. It's usually immigrants, right? And still to this day, immigrants are coming to the country in big numbers, despite our government doing everything they possibly can to make it more difficult. That's another talk for another time. Um, but this actually goes back to some of the first waves of immigrants actually come to the colonies, of course, but also after the founding of America and the the government being set up in, in the late 1780s. You start to see Germans, and, and of course, in the 19th century, we see the Irish, we see Italians, we see Eastern Europeans, we see all sorts of folks in different waves coming over, right? Well, that's when the term was first used. It's, it really becomes popularized by the historian in 1931 in his book, Epic of America. And what he is talking about, he says, you know, there's always been an American dream, but it has changed, right? And that's something we're going to talk about today, right? How the baby boomers really reset or recalibrated what it means to achieve the American dream. Think of, so when we're talking about baby boomers, we're talking about those born between 1946 and 1964. If one of my sisters was here, who was born in 1965, I would move it up a year so that she is a baby boomer, but technically she's not. So, um, but any guesses on the number of births? How many kids are born in that period, 46 to 64? Any, any guesses? No, no wrong answers. Well, there are, but we won't, we won't give you a hard time. Close, about 80, about 80 million over that period. The average family in that period has 3.37 kids. My family, I was born two minutes from here in Havertown. I'm one of 11, so my family skewed it a bit the other way, okay? And half of my siblings are baby boomers, so they're much older than I am. And the other half are not. But the point being, you know, think of, and, and what we can do is if you, if you go back a generation before the baby boomers, and maybe a little bit more than a generation, if you go back to World War I, right? So we're probably talking parents or even potentially the grandparents of baby boomers, right? Think of what they dealt with. So they're dealing with a nation that's growing, right? That's getting exploited under Roosevelt and then Taft and then Woodrow Wilson, correct? It's in 1920, so actually first, the Great War, as it's called, 1914 to 1918. Then you have what we've just been through a pandemic, right? You have one of the worst pandemics in the history of the world, the influenza pandemic, epidemic, right? Which kills millions of people worldwide. And then you've got, you know, after the war, there is a recession here in America. America comes out of World War I for the first time in its history as a creditor nation. We are not a debtor nation. It's the good old days, right? We're, now we're back to where we start. But it's because of 
all of the material that we supplied to the Allies during World War I. Well, after World War I, as troops are coming back into the country, there's first a recession, and then, of course, we have the Great Depression, right? 1929. So think of what families are going through. You know, my grandparents lived through the First World War, lived through the pandemic, the influenza pandemic, and then lived through the Depression and got through, and thank God they did, because I'm here. Otherwise, it would be a totally different story. But point being, when we come out of World War II, there is a major concern that the returning troops are going, you know, they're going to need all sorts of help, right? We have the GI Bill, which was passed in 1944, which is arguably one of the greatest pieces of legislation to come through Congress. And I know it's hard to imagine today when Congress really doesn't do anything that something could actually be accomplished. And yes, the various amendments of you know, ending of slavery and voting rights being granted, those are absolutely some of the biggest in the, the, the Bill of Rights. But the GI Bill of Rights in 1944 says, you as a veteran, and we happen to have, and I, I did not tell him I was going to do this, but we happen to have a World War II veteran in our presence today, George, who fought in the Pacific on Okinawa during World War II. Thank you for your service, George. Um, but the government is saying, this is our way of repaying men and women who served during the war, right? We're going to educate them. We're going to help them get no low interest or no interest loans so that they can buy homes. In 1920, as America is coming out of World War I, it's the first time in our history more people live in cities than in rural areas. The suburbs, so to speak, have not been invented, right? Not yet. We're going to talk about that with Levittown after World War II. Well, after World War II, and we'll talk more about Levittown, you see a swing the other way. People, and especially families, as they're having more children, are saying, wait a second, we can't live in the grand apartment in Philadelphia. Let's get out to Havertown. Let's get out to Westchester. Now, in 1940, I'm pretty sure Westchester was the other side of the world for somebody who's living in Havertown, right? We didn't, we didn't have the mobility that we have today. But the point being, what you see is people say, hey, I want to raise a family. I want to go to school. I want to start a job. And, and think of it. If you have a college degree, you're getting a better job, a better high-paying job, right? Theoretically, after the war, which allows you to get married and have kids and have a family. And what does that do to the economy? And we're going to talk about all these things. It drives the, the economy. We go from, and this really starts right after World War II, we go from a primarily manufacturing economy to a service economy. So yes, there's still manufacturing. There's still, those things are still happening. Philadelphia, from the founding of the country until World War II, until the end of World War II, is one of the largest textile centers in the world, manufacturing centers. It's after World War II where it falls off, okay? And, but we see this happening all over the nation. It goes to more of a service economy. And part of that, too, is veterans who are being educated aren't taking a factory job. Nothing wrong with a factory job. We need things, right? We need cars. We need refrigerators. We need air conditioners, all these sorts of things. But baby boomers tend to go to now, rather than a local, you know, local company, they're working for multinational companies, which are huge behemoths, right? Uh, GE, General Motors, IBM, all these sorts of things. And some companies, of course, which are no longer around, Sears, right? Although I think they're still around, but not really so much because of uh, internet commerce and things like that. So millions of men and women served during World War II. They come back, and again, the government says, okay, we're going to help you out. We are going to educate you. We are going to help you get a home, if you so desire one. We are going to do all these other things to get you back on track. And what does that do? Think of you know, dropping a, a pebble in a pond, right? And you see the ripple effect. But what's, what does that do for the American economy? You have you know, more educated 
workers. You have people making more money. Well, when people make more money, they're going to spend more money, right? And especially if they're moving from a small apartment in Philadelphia to a home in Havertown or Wayne or Westchester, what do they need? Furniture, appliances, all these sorts of things, right? Where are they going to get them? American companies are making these things. And that's why the economy explodes after World War II. There's a lot of talk now about whether or not we're in a recession, right? Depending on who you read and you know, what, what uh, philosophy you, you follow, we are or we aren't. We just know times are tough, right? Baby boomers, for the most part, were born at the right time. Great economies for most of your lives, right? Yes, we have the, the uh, oil embargo and fuel prices in the 1970s, right? And inflation. We have a recession in the 80s. We have the great economic meltdown in 2008. But from 1945, and really it's 46, 1946 until current day, average GDP growth, 3.1%. Now that includes some clunkers. In 2020, we were down about 3.5%. Annual, but it also includes some great years, the 40s, the, you know, the late 40s, the 50s. 1950, GDP growth in the third quarter of 1950, almost 14%, which is unbelievable. And it's just an example of, think of troops coming home, right? 1945, 1946. If they're, being, they're going to college or they're going to trade school or whatever it may be, by 1950, they probably got some cash in their pocket. Maybe they're married at this point. Maybe they purchased a house, a car, whatever it may be. They've got to buy the, the things then so that they can live. Furniture, appliances. You know, the, the, the funny thing about appliances, right? Vacuum cleaners, washer, washers and dryers, dishwashers. They were supposed to make our lives easier, right? They were going to, they were time saving devices. I can tell you, as the guy who vacuums in my house, Time is just lost, you know, and I do the dishes as well. So, but the point being, these appliances really didn't save us time. We just found more time to do other, you know, to do these sorts of chores, to devote more time to it. And, you know, when you're running the vacuum cleaner and a day later, there's a mess, you say, oh my gosh, I have to run it again, right? So it's just that it's a wicked cycle. But the point of all of this is that after the war, as Families are growing, right? Things are changing. And it's not just economically. Think of the impact that baby boomers have had politically, socially, you know, on and on and on. And, and as I've said before, we will talk about that in more detail. One of the big, what's the word, technological advances, right? So now it's the internet. It's, you know, I've got a, a wireless microphone. You can see me from your couch. I don't know if that's a good thing, but, you know, you don't have to be here live and have a time. You can be wherever you wish to be, which is great. It's a convenience, right? Well, the big invention, what do you think the big invention is in the late 40s, or early 50s that just explodes? Television, right? And think of the impact that television has in the 50s and really in the 60s, 70s, and forward, right? You're now seeing things on television that maybe you've heard about on the radio or that you're reading about in the newspaper. So think about, and we'll talk about it, sorry, I keep saying that, the Civil Rights Movement, right? The Vietnam War, Watergate, all these things are now being televised, which the ripple effect of that is that baby boomers get more involved politically socially. Uh, there's a stat, and this is a, the beauty of giving a new talk, which this is. Do, do a lot of research and you get a lot of geeky stats. The geekiest of geeky stats that I found, you know, think of our current political leadership. A lot of baby boomers, and that's fine, right? By the time the baby boom generation was, the minimum age to serve in Congress is 25 years old. By the time the average baby boomer is 25 years old, 10% of them are serving in Congress. 
That number today, not even close. The most uh, current generation one is Gen Z or Gen, and I'm sorry, I'm really bad at this, but their average age now is 32. They have yet to reach 10% representation in Congress. And think about it, most people in Congress stay in Congress, right? Regardless of their effectiveness. And again, that's another talk for another time. But the point being, baby boomers got involved young, got involved early. You know, talking about television, think of the effect John F. Kennedy has as president, optically, right? You could all, you could compare the optics almost to a President Obama, young, vibrant. You know, what does John F. Kennedy talk about? A new torch is, uh, the torch has been passed, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what we can do for your country. And that helps to spur activism and involvement by younger generations. You know, he's got a young family, he's got a young wife, young children. After, you know, and they were, you know, good presidents in their own right, but after Dwight D. Eisenhower and Harry Truman and FDR, right? After having much more aged leadership, having this young, you know, and again, in coordination with television, it just gives baby boomers an entirely different, what's the word I want? Um, it, it really is the, the push that they need to be involved because they are inspired by what they are seeing on, on television. The generation before baby boomers, the public, and that this is going to sound funny today, the public had much more trust in their government. You know, FDR is doing stuff during the war, which he's got to do under War Emergency Powers Acts, but which quite frankly are a bit, you know, the, um, you know, uh, the internment camps, horrible, staying on his legacy, right? But he's doing it out of safety. You should almost, you know, to a degree, think of America after 9-11. Everything was in the name of safety and certain rights are given up. I'm not comparing giving up some rights to being interned in a, in a camp in, in, on the West Coast. But the point being, with the advent of television and the way that baby boomers got more involved, trust in government actually fell. Vietnam, right? Vietnam absolutely resets how people look at government. Watergate, you know, also resets how people look at government. We're at the point now where trust in government is probably as low as, it, as it's ever been. That also plays into partisanship and things like that, right? But in that, in that sweet spot that we're talking about, you know, you go from World War II where it was, hey, you have to support the government, you can't speak out against the government to 20 years later with Vietnam, think of protests on college campuses and think of the counterculture and hippies and the summer of love and all these things that come together and initially of course now i wasn't around i was a I, actually i was a baby but thinking of you know the older generation saying oh my gosh you can't do this you can't speak against the government we're in this war you have to support the war you don't you're communist right well you as younger Individuals of that baby boom generation are saying, wait a second, we're not being told. It. This does not, you know, we shouldn't be here. You know, when when men who are drafted are being helped to escape to Canada, right? Because they it's the conscientious objectors. Think of Muhammad Ali, he's at the height of his fascist flight, he's at the height of his career, he's a conscientious objector. They take the title away from him, right? Because they say you're not being good American, you're not being patriotic. Well, it's one of the first real examples of, and of course it happens during previous wars, but Muhammad Ali is probably one of the most notable who says, this goes against everything I'm, I'm, I believe in, right? So it's those sorts of things that you start to see with the baby boom generation. Um, if, there, if there are questions throughout, please feel free to ask other both live and folks on Zoom, and I'll be happy to address them. Um, so let's talk about Levittown, basically the, the creation of the suburbs, okay? So one of the first lifestyle changes after World War II is 
the creation of the suburbs. You have visionary developers, Sam Levitt and Sons, who say, hey, you know, people don't want to live in cramped quarters close together, larger families in Manhattan. They want to go out to Long Island. Let's build these homes for them. It got to the point where, and of course, it's named Levittown, much Levittown here locally, also named after Sam Levitt and Sons. And I believe there's a Levittown in, an, in, of all places, Puerto Rico. There's a Levittown, Puerto Rico as well. So there are three Levittowns. Um, and they were all playing communities. And Sam Levitt and his sons are saying, you know, George has come back from the war. He doesn't want to live in a dorm. He wants a home. He wants to show that he is succeeding. He's got a well-paying job. He's bought a car. He's got, you know, he's able to do all these things. It got to the point where the builders of Levittown were building a house. Let me get this right. It's every 16 days they're putting a the house together. Many of the houses that were initially built in Levittown are still standing today. Now they were basically cookie cutter, but still you've got a home, you've got a, a yard, you've got a garage, you've got, you know. They also included, and this is fantastic, in each home, a built-in TV and a hi-fi system. In each home. So, and all the homes were, were basically the same. The cost was the same. You could get a certain option or a certain appliance included, whatever it may be. But the other thing that the government did as part of the GI Bill of Rights is they say, as a returning veteran, you have to put 5% down on a home in Levittown. We're going to give you a loan at 0%. Basically giving you money to say, here you go. Thank you for your service. Here's how we're going to repay you. And Levittown cannot make homes quicker, quickly enough. You then have other builders who say, and what, what's the saying? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You have other builders who are saying, oh my gosh, if people are doing this up on Long Island, what can we do here in Philadelphia, Chicago, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, or whatever it may be? So you start to see other people building. And this is the creation of suburbs. Suburbs today for Philadelphia, I think, are Lancaster, right? It just keeps moving further and further and further west, right? But that also shows how the infrastructure has changed. Another big change that comes, and it's not because, well, no, it actually is, it's, it's a ripple effect as we're talking about. What's one of the great things that Eisenhower does? He builds the interstate highway system, right? So that you can live in, you know, you can live further out from the city. People who are living in Long Island in Levittown, many of them are working in Manhattan, right? So they're either driving in or they're taking a subway, taking a train, whatever it may be. So distance is not nearly the impediment that it was in 1920 if you lived, you know, if you worked in the city, you probably lived in the city, right? Or you live very close to it. Now you can live. 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles outside of the city and go into work. And it's these sorts of things that absolutely paved the way for the way for how baby boomers, as they are aging, and I know where you, know, where you really start to see the effect of baby boomers is in the 60s, right? Because those born in, in 46 are teenagers in the early 60s. It's not really until Vietnam, 68, 69, 70, as baby boomers get older and have more of a voice, a political voice, and say, hey, we don't have to support this. We can vote you out of office. We can, you know, we can do our talking with the way that we're going to vote for you. It's these sorts of things that absolutely, you know, if you go back a generation, the baby boomers' parents, they, they were not, yes, there were pockets of resistance to the war or to government policies, but not nearly to the degree that you see in the 60s, the 70s, and moving forward. Okay. Let's see here. Now, it's not all sunshine and lollipops for the baby boomers, right? Women in the 50s, you know, those who, so think of, let's go back to World War II, men are off to war. Women are working in factories, right? Rosie the River, 
very liberating experience. And women are saying, finally, we're getting our chance to show that we can contribute. Who else? Minorities. You have another wave of what's known as the Great Migration, right? You have African Americans from the South and minorities from the South coming up to Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Cleveland, Boston, whatever it may be, to manufacture, right? The economy during the war, you know, Henry Ford isn't making cars. He's making B-29 bombers. He's making, you know, planes. He's making, and he's not the only one. There are other industries that have completely turned to a war of Women are working in these factories, right? Minorities are working in these factories. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, we finally are getting a chance. Well, what happens when troops come back from World War II, when they're told your place is in the home? Make a good home, raise a family. And, and of course, the thought is, wait a second. A couple of years ago, I'm you know, putting together a B-29 bomber in Henry Ford's factory in Detroit. How, why all of a sudden am I not qualified to do that? The same with minorities. They're saying, nope, you're not needed anymore. What comes out of this? And we're a little ways off, but not far, as the baby boomers you know, are getting into their teens and 20s, women's liberation movement or women's rights movement, right? Think of the, the what at the time was going to be the 27th Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment, right? First state to ratify it once it gets through Congress and the Senate is Hawaii. However, it falls short of 38 states, which is the three quarters majority needed to pass an amendment. And the, the Equal Rights Amendment just dies on the vine. But what do you have? What comes out of this? And, and really it's the precursor to this, the National Organization of Women and other like organizations, Betty for Dan, Gloria Steinem, right? Pick up the women's, you know, and how it has expanded today, the Me Too movement and, and those sorts of things, right? And gender identity and all these sorts of things. Um, but back in the 60s, when this is first coming to fruition, and, and it actually starts, if you go back, of course, a century before, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and voting rights and things like that. And it, it, it's actually an offshoot of the abolition movement to end slavery. And abolitionists were very upset with the Elizabeth Cady Stantons of the world, the Susan B. Anthony's of the world, because they said, hey, wait a second, we can't confuse the public. Let's get rid of slavery, and then we can tackle women's rights. And women are saying, wait a second, rights are rights. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, if we're talking about free slaves or if we're talking about women. Rights are rights. So fast forward into the 60s, where, and into the early 70s, right? You have in Manhattan in 1972, on the 50th anniversary of the uh, women's voting rights amendment coming through, women say, hey, you know what? For us to be taken seriously and to move this forward, equal pay, non-discrimination, right? Sexual harassment, all these sorts of things which we're still talking about today, women in August of 1972 say, we're gonna go on strike today. We're not gonna do any work in the home and we're not gonna do any work whatsoever. 50,000 women marched down Fifth Avenue in New York City, in Manhattan, with various signs and placards saying, and as groups, organized groups, National Organization of Women, but also individuals. And then there were what were called sister marches in cities around the nation saying, don't forget us. You know, we have, women have rights that are not being fulfilled part of this as well. What, what's another big movement that happens in the 60s? Quite frankly, starts with an you know, offshoot of because of Jim Crow legislation. And JFK tries to you know, get some things done. He's then assassinated. It's LBJ, the Great Society, right? Civil rights legislation, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, all in the you know, mid to late 60s. 
when LBJ puts this legislation through at the time, and I know it's hard to imagine contemporarily because, you know, for the most part, the South is a very Republican area, and urban centers in the North tend to be more uh, Democratic, right? Or small D or big D, I guess, talking about the way that they vote. Well, when you go back into the 50s and 60s, it's the other way around. The South had more Democrats, voted more for Democrats, whereas urban areas and cities voted more Republican. When LBJ signs civil rights legislation, the Great Society, right? He says, I fear I've lost the South forever for the Democratic Party. And that's exactly what happens in the switches, where it's now, you know, as I said, it's Democratic more North, Republican more South. But these are important steps. You have Brown versus Board of Education, right? 1954, saying that, you know, separate but equal is not equal in education, all these sorts of things. Busing, right? Integration of schools. All these things come about because involvement of, and, and the more attuned that baby boomers are politically and socially, where their parents are saying, oh my gosh, what are you doing? We never did this. Well, yeah, baby boomers were much more head or finger on the pulse and saying, hey, if this is the society we're going to live in, we want to be much more involved. We can make it better, right? Climate, which we're, we, we've been talking about you know, basically my entire life, I'm sure, your entire lives. Um, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, climate was also a big issue, right? Greenpeace and all these other sorts of organizations. It's just these things have been carried forward and the political involvement today that people have really is born out of the baby boomer experience and how you know it wasn't simply well I get to vote every you know every year locally and every two years for a congress and every six years for a senator and every four years for president. No, it's not simply showing up and voting and that's, that's it. There was much more involvement locally, civically, you know, at a state level, at, at, at a national level as well. And these are things that are you know the results of baby boomers being so much more involved than in previous generations. And quite frankly, you can almost say current generation, right? Because it seems that there's been a disconnect because there's so much less trust in government, right? What do they do? But I'm always fascinated by polls. And people will say, you know, what do you think of Congress? Oh, I think Congress is horrible. Well, what do you think of your Congress person? They're fantastic. You know, it's everybody else who's the problem except for my local congressman, right? Well, it's, it, it doesn't matter where you ask that question, whether it's Pennsylvania, Illinois, or California, you basically get the same answer. It's throw the bugs out except for mine. I really like it. They're very effective. So fascinating stuff. Um, let me see here. You know, talking about... Um, the civil rights movement, and of course, in the 50s and 60s, you have the freedom riders, right? You have the lunch counter sit-ins at Woolworths. Who is that? It's the Hebrews, right? It's, it's kid, college kids or you know, younger um, who are saying, this is wrong. And of course, creates all sorts of issues. But what helps to increase the nation's awareness about it? television. It's on TV. You know, you see James Meredith being escorted into the University of Mississippi, or you see fire hoses, unfortunately, and dogs being sicked on marchers, right, on uh, African Americans as the margin. What happens on the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Al Al Alabama? What happens to, unfortunately, to Martin Luther King, right? Um, you have the March on Washington, where you have a quarter of a million people, all races, colors, and creeds who show up and hear the I have a dream speech as well as others, right? Arguably one of the greatest speeches in American history, and particularly on civil rights. So it's all these sorts of things where baby boomers are pushing the envelope in a good way, where again, their parents are saying to them, hey, wait a sec, what are you doing? You know, you're upset in the apple cart. Let, let the people in Washington worry about this. Well, Baby Boomer said, absolutely not. This is not how we want this society to be. 
let's see here, bear with me. Um, you know, talking about, and not that we will talk heavily about Vietnam, but you know, in addition to some of the other things that we that we have discussed, losing trust in government, it's when initially, you know, LBJ says, hey, this is we're not going to be heavily involved here. And the numbers keep rising each month as far as involvement, and, you know, militarily and sending money and those sorts of things, right? Well, it's when he, he goes all in and says, hey, we are completely involved. We're sending you know, tens of thousands of, of soldiers over. It's when he loses the American public, right? And it's the you know, famous Walter Cronkite newscast when he says, when you lost you know, a certain section of the public, you know, you're just done. And it's also why LBJ doesn't run for a second term. He says, I can't do this because he knows he's crippled himself politically because of the damage that's been done by Vietnam, as well as other things, right? But, um, you know, connected to Vietnam, all sorts of turmoil happened. Civil rights, Vietnam, voting rights, right? Think of the, the Watts riots. Think of, you know, after Martin Luther King is assassinated, think of the rioting in various cities. People saying, oh my gosh, you can't go through this. And you have Bobby Kennedy, right? Same thing. People put the hooks on, on Bobby Kennedy as, hey, this is the guy. He's going to carry forward what his brother was unable to do. He's assassinated. And again, I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing he's assassinated, but people's reactions to it, right? The point of it is baby boomers are more involved. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a blase attitude. It was we can change things. We can do things here. And many things that my generation, just after the baby boomers, I want to make sure I get that in, um, and, and succeeding ones have benefited from your involvement, from what you have done. Change is not easy, right? Many times status quo is, yeah, we can complain about it, but sometimes it's easier to complain about it than it is to actually come up with a solution, as we see with our government today, right? You know, no, it's easy to criticize everybody else, but it's when somebody comes up with an idea, you know, well, Jim's idea stinks. Well, what idea do you have? I don't have one. I just know his is bad. That's where we are, unfortunately. It wasn't like that, right? There were real, we tackled tough issues and, and talked about these things and really moved the ball. We have um, to stay about Trump's pay. What's that? We have to stay about Trump's pay. So, just another, and I shouldn't say just, same thing, it's, you know, you see the aftermath, and again, me being so young, you know, it's, it affects me differently, and, you know, you could, you could think of, think of the different mass shootings that are happening, unfortunately, in our society, not so much politically connected as some are, but some are just, you know, people are mental issues or whatever it may be. Kent State, same thing. It's, it helps to erode trust in government even further. It's just another, you know, it's almost like you're stacking things on top of, you know, Kent State alone, horrible, right? But add it to Vietnam, add it to Watergate, add it to everything else that's going on. And then, you know, we, I mentioned it earlier, in the 70s, economically, we start to have issues, right? With the uh, OPEC crisis, oil crisis, fuel crisis. Um, one thing I do remember, and again, I was about eight years old, nine years old at this point, is, you know, you could only, depending on what your license plate ended in, you could go get gas on Tuesdays or Thursdays. And when you went, you were there for two hours. I mean, it was just crazy. And I remember thinking as a young kid, like, this is nuts. Like, we shouldn't be able to get gas when you want, but that's the way it is. But I'm not skirting around the, the Kent State question. It's just, it was another thing. It's almost like a snowball rolling down a hill, right? It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's just another example. Of, oh my gosh, what's happening with our society? Here? What's going on here? And it also inspired people who maybe were on the sidelines who had said, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm against Vietnam, but I'm not going to get involved. Yeah, Watergate's bad, but I'm not going to get involved. 
off. It's when you know you see a contemporary come down on campus and you say, oh my gosh, you know what? That could be me. You know, that could be my friend. And, and it, it inspires and people that was the military. Right. right. And that's the thing. Right. Absolutely. Like, okay, we have cops, we might have problems with cops. Right. But this is our own military. Right. You know, this was a thing that I remember from it. I think I was 10. Right. From that angle. Right. And good point. It's it's our own military. So right. it's just just bad, bad stuff. Um, so Watergate, and, and what Watergate does is I, in the past, have given uh, a talk on the history of the press and, and how it has changed dramatically, right? We all have, uh, I'm looking for it on my cell phones over there, good. But we, you, know, you can get the news 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your cell phone, right? Or on a computer or whatever it may be. No, I and this now I am going to sound old. I miss the days of you had news from six to seven o'clock every night, and then at eleven o'clock, right? Twenty-four hour news. Now I'm getting people's opinions, and that's fine. I get it, but like I just want news. I don't care what you think about. Just tell me. I want Tom Brokaw. I want Peter Jennings. I want right. I want Chet Huntley. I want you know David Brinkley. I want to hear the news. Just tell me the news. That's all I want. Well, what Watergate does is it changes journalism dramatically. We were talking earlier before, before the talk started about um, Woodward, right? Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. And the work that they did, you know, the, the movie All the Presidents Men, right? With Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. My goal in life would be to be played by Robert Redford, although you know, not blonde, and now he's about 80 years old, but still, you know, not, not, a, not a bad thing, right? But the way that, so Watergate had been a story that was, you know, many people knew about in the press, but at the time, you know, investigative journalism hadn't quite taken, right? And people were kind of burned out with Vietnam, right? And all of the, the reporting on, well, Woodward and Bernstein initially go to their editor and the editor is like, how did they add it? Right? Well, they dig and dig and dig and expose the, the greatest political, you know, one of the greatest political reports that happening lately, um, miscarriages of, you know, operation in our country's history. And what that does is it then inspires the youth boomers who are in college who say, hey, you know what? I think I want to go into journalism. It is a, you know, a valuable and respected occupation. Maybe not so much anymore, right? In my, you know, and this is, this is the nice part about giving a talk. You get to hear my opinion, which you didn't pay to hear. Um, but, you know, we've gone from, you know, the press and the news used to be, let's get it right. Now it's let's be first. Doesn't matter if I'm right. If I'm the first guy to come out and say, this person did this, I'll get my 15 minutes of fame, and then the story's going to change 827 times when the facts come out, right? And we see it all the time. And that's because we have 24 7 access to news, which I'm kidding. That's not a bad thing. The more information, the more transparency is good. But it seems like the quality has gone. Before Watergate, much of the reporting was surface report. You did not, yes, there were instances where you had, you know, great reporting, great investigative journalism, but it's really Woodward and Bernstein who absolutely turned journalism on its ear, and you have what's called the new journalism, right? New literary journalism, where people spend more time, right? It's almost like 60 minutes. So rather than spending, you know, Tom Brokaw spending 30 seconds on a story and moving on a minute at most, moving on to the next story, they're doing a 20-minute segment on 60 minutes about this topic, right? Woodward and Bernstein spending weeks and months getting to the bottom of it and all the difficulties that they encounter, right, to do it. But what it does is it inspires this new journalism, as it's called, where you have much more in-depth reporting. And it's not simply, oh, there was a bank robbery on Tuesday at the Wawa, right? It's, 
there's a lot more meat to it. So these sorts of changes come about because of, again, the baby boomers getting into these sorts of occupations and, and moving the ball forward. While we're talking about work, and we're at about eight o'clock, um, and I know we got started late, but we probably have about 10, 15 minutes left. And then again, any questions that you have, please uh, shout them out or type them in and Mary will we'll read them out and we'll address them. But the way that baby boomers work, and I talked about it earlier, going to work for multinational companies. Most, and I'm saying most, I know three baby boomers, right? My in-laws and, <laughs> and uh, well, I know more than that, but my, my sample size is small. But Think of, of today, you know, people working are very transient. There's, you don't see the loyalty that you saw a generation ago. It wasn't uncommon for, if you started with a company, you stayed with that company for a long time. It might be the only company you worked for, right? There was loyalty. There was, you know, the other thing in working, face-to-face, -face, right? Today, it's, oh, I'm going to text Gene and I'll see if he gets back to me. I'm going to shoot them an email. Now, granted, the technology has changed, right? But go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, right? A lot more face-to-face -face interaction. Baby boomers wanted to be seen, wanted to be recognized. Well, that's not just baby boomers. I should say it's employees of that time period. You want your boss to see you and say, great job. Where do we stand on this? So you have that face-to-face -face personal interaction. Now it's, well, I'm going to send an email. I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and send an email to make it look like I'm really working hard. And my boss will see this. And then I can fall back to sleep for an hour and a half and then go. For, but it's much less personal, right? There's You don't have the going into an office. Now, again, the pandemic has changed that too, right? Completely changed the way that we work the way that we attend library presentations, right? Um, as well as other things. We can do things online, we can do things with technology. But, you know, go back 25 years. When did Al Gore invent the internet? It's early 2000s, right? So about 25 years. You know, you still had to interact with people, and you still do today, I'm being facetious, but it wasn't done over a handshake. It wasn't done at a, you know, over a meeting. It wasn't done over a lunch, over a dinner, you know, or it was, I should say, today. Much less of that. It's very much, and it's a blessing and a curse because with a cell phone or with a computer, you could be at the beach. You could be on vacation. You could, there's no downtime, right? When you were working, you know, when baby boomers were working, they said, hey, I've worked all year for this week at the beach. I'm not checking. I'm, and unfortunately, you didn't have the technology to do it, right? Although you may have called into the office or checked in with a coworker. Now it's people are glued to their phones, right? And again, it's a less personal interaction. It's a less personal way that people are working. It's more hey, I've got these four tasks, I've got to send out six emails, and then I'm done. I'm not talking to anybody, right? I'm just sending a message, I'm sending a text, I'm whatever it may be. And you see a big change in that. Um, you have, in the 70, and we've talked about this a, a bit, 1970 to 80, with all of the economic, and, and again, it's really the fuel crisis, a recession in 80, you know, after uh, Reagan comes into office and then we have conspicuous consumption in the, you know, the mid to late 80s when I could then be termed a yuppie at that point because I was born in that generation. Um, but what you have is attitudes toward work and employers start to change where people say, hey, you know what? I've been here. I expect more. You know, and where you really see it is when we get into the 90s, into that dot-com boom, where it seemed like you could come up with, hi, I, I, I'm the creator of Jim.com, and I'm a millionaire overnight on paper, and then you know, the dot-com bubble burst, and I've got nothing. I'm selling pencils out on the street. But the point being, in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
you know, my father-in-law, and I don't think he's going to mind my saying this, and especially since he's not here to defend himself, but he worked for the same company his entire career, 40 plus years, almost, I'm doing the math, that was a history major, 45 years, from the day he graduated college until the day he retired. Now, the name of the company changed several times, and he was very successful, did very well, which was one company. You don't see that now, right? If, if somebody's with a company today for 25 years, 30 years, people say, oh my gosh, how did you do it? If you're with a company for five years anymore, people say, oh my gosh, sorry. but why aren't you looking? Aren't you getting the itch to go somewhere else? Your generation, there was more loyalty and there was more, I don't know if respect is the word, but you, I'll, I'll go with respect. There was more respect for the employer employee relationship. <clears throat> now it's much more, and I'm sure there was some of this back then, but now it's much more what's in it for me? I have no loyalty. I've worked with your company now, Jane's company is offering me five grand more or whatever. I'm going to go work there. Sayonara. So there's a lot less, you know, staying in one place and, and being not static, but, you know, not moving around. Um, as, as there was that. Well, that is, from your perspective, an overall change. You had to do it was driven by the necessities of Wall Street, maximizing profits, uh, the concept of mastery of the universe. Right. That came into fashion. How much of that was really the impetus for changing the attitude? I, I think it's a combination of both. And I think, I, I think to your point, you know, think of, and, and you all could answer this a lot better than I can. And this is also part of the fallout of 24 7 news. There are channels where you can watch the stock market, right? And quite frankly, I'm fascinated by it. Not so much over the past few months because I see my 401k go down in the hopper, but you can now sit, you know, go back 30 and 40 years. Where would you get, you know, what happened in the stock market, in the paper, on the news? You know, here you can watch all day. I have, I have a friend who's a day trader. I would jump off the wall with a bridge. I wouldn't be able to do it because it's just like this. It would drive me absolutely bonkers. You know, that our, our financial advisor, and he's not the only one, others have said this, don't look at your account every day. You'll drive yourself nuts. Well, when it's going well, I want to see it. When it's going bad, I don't. But when it's going bad, that's what I tend to look at it for, right? Exactly. But no, I think it's, I think it's a combination of, you know, Think of in the 80s, um, you know, how, how Wall Street and conspicuous consumption and how things just really took off in, you know, towards midway to late in Reagan's first term. And then he's overwhelmingly elected in the second term because the economy's doing so well. Well, a lot of that too is built on, you know, junk bonds and these sorts of things. But I think it's also the attitudes of, you know, and, and again, I'm going to sound like I'm, much, I'm going to sound like my father, but you know, I just don't get the younger generation today how you don't have that connection. I I thrive on connecting with people, right? Um, rather than oh, I'm just going to send you a text and I'll wait for your response. I rather call and talk to somebody. And if possible, and it's harder now because of the pandemic, it's hard to do this, right? I'm, I'm thrilled that we're able to do things live and in person. Um, Zoom is a great technology. Might you lose something in it, right? Um, fortunately for you Zoom people, you can sign off anytime. These four people are stuck here until I'm done. But, but no, I think it's a combination of stuff. And I think there's, there's a higher focus now on earnings reports. You know, and there are more people involved in the stock market at a younger age. You know, when you get your first job, what do they say? Sign up for the 401k. The company's going to match half up to a certain percentage to make sure. When I was 22, I didn't know what the heck. I didn't know my elbow from my from a hole in the ground. I can't get invested. I just thought, oh, okay, I'm putting a few bucks away. I don't know what it's doing. I think it's a combination of both and how. And I think the other thing you see now, and, and it, it harkens back a little bit to when, you know, to the 50s, to, you know, the, the early 60s, when baby boomers were starting to get their financial 
chops together, right? You're coming out of college, you're getting a job, you're making money, you're buying a house. It was, hey, I can have one really nice car, or you know what? I've got one car, I have two cars, right? Why not have the bigger house? Why not have these sorts of things? I don't recall this. When were IRAs for one case you met? I argue that you could clock the downfall of the American employee and the change in the relationship with employers when that happened because corporations relinquish their responsibilities right. to their employers to help them with their retirement. Absolutely. No, you're right. And, and who wasn't it uh, Senator Roth out of uh, Delaware? Delaware. Thank you. Yes. Who the Roth IRA, right? And so I want to, and I could be dead wrong. If someone on wants to Google it and get extra credit tonight, oh. right? So maybe you know, seventies, eighties. But you're right. There's, you know, employers have shifted a lot of that responsibility now to the worker, right? Whereas before it was, let me walk you through this, let me help you with this. So it's not only the employee relationship to the employer that's changed, it's vice versa, right? And, and that may be why you see more transient you know, movement as opposed to, hey, you hired me out of college, I'm gonna stay here and give you my best for as long as I can. Now it's, eh, I've been here five years, I did all right, let me see if there's something else out there. You know? So that's a very good point, very good question. I don't remember when they started the IRA and stuff, but I do remember this. One of the reasons behind it was that it freed the employee to go from one job to the next right. without feeling like if every time you move, you have to start your retirement. Right. Over again. Correct. So there, there is some portability to it. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yes, sir. I guess I would, and you kind of just said this, but I don't think it was just the employer who didn't have as much respect for the, uh, it wasn't the employee that was the only one. They didn't have respect for the employer. I think the relationship of the employer to the employee, I mean, my dad worked for DuPont for his entire life, right, right. out of college. Um, but, you know, it was like a family. Absolutely. Um, but then as, you know, companies were having the pressure for the bottom line and dividends, you know, uh, then they go through a series of layoffs. Um, and all of a sudden, it's not a family anymore. People right. People are, are shown Right. So I think it was a two two way street. Absolutely. In terms of, you know, people did you know go on to find other companies, but it wasn't secure in these companies the way it had been. Correct. No, definitely, and it's the line from the Godfather. It's not personal; it's business, right? So you don't have that personal connection. I started here my first day out of college, and I'm going to be here for all. I've been through personally. Gosh. And I know this isn't about me. I've been through about six downsizings and survived most of them. Thank God, knock on wood. But when it happens, I mean, it's it's just horrible because you lose friends, you know, and people move on and go to other things. But you know, one day you're there and you think, oh my gosh, this is great. And the next day, and I'm sure we've all been through it. Family members go through whatever it may be. But yeah, Mary, you're absolutely right. That that relationship, it's not a one way street. It's absolutely changed. And you know, when you have stockholders who say, hey, how come we're not making as much? You know, that drives a lot of this behavior as well. I guess I had another question about what you see this generation in terms of the mega trends. Right. So we're we're seeing, you know, people kind of held on after the Great Recession of 08. Right. There were boomers. Yeah. And now we're starting to see them finally retire. Right. Um, what's your sense about you know how that's going to impact society going forward? So dramatically. So the positive effect that the boomer generation had on our economy, right? Needing cars and homes, and you know, also you know, part of uh, a part of it, which I really didn't discuss, is you know, student loans and those things, and how you know, growing up in college, my parents put a very big value on going to college. Now, not every one of my siblings did. Someone in the military, and it's great, you know, we all have our choices, but I even feel lately that's changed because, you know, the costs and how they're talking about, well, if you have college debt, we'll forget a certain percentage of it, and those sorts of things. But I promise I'm gonna answer your question. Um, what you're starting to see is the way that baby boomers positively affected the economy 
during your earning years, right? And purchasing and those sorts of things and raising a family. Well, to Mary's point, I think the number is 10,000 baby boomers a day are retiring. So again, eighty step. This is I love this stuff. So they say by twenty thirty, the vast majority of baby boomers are going to be, you know, the the youngest baby boomers will be sixty. Again, history major, not math, will be sixty six, sixty seven. So some baby boomers are working past that retirement age, a traditional retirement age of sixty five. But the the fear is, you know, baby boomers aren't going to be buying. And aren't going to be buying goods as much as they have. And there's still going to be what's going to get hit hard healthcare, right? Social security. And it's already, you know, they're already fretting about it. And, you know, my fear is, and again, this is another talk for another time, our government can't get out of its own way. How are they going to solve what happens with Medicare and social security and those sorts of things? But that's where I think, Mary, you're going to see the next real big. Discussion and it's going to take some courage because what's what's the goal of every one-term congressman, one-term senator, one-term president to get another term, right? So are they going to get another term saying, "Hey, we really have to work on Social Security"? No, probably not because they're going to scare people. They're going to be honest and scare people. What I think we're going to see the next big, you know, effect of the baby boomer generation. Is those retirements, right, as, as the last wave, so to speak, happens, and it's healthcare. And so baby boomers now are that sandwich generation. Some baby boomers are caring for their parents, and they have adult children living at home, right, because of various reasons. So baby boomers are, you know, it's not the way it was for their parents or grandparents who say, okay, 65, I'm retired and that's it. Um, and and what, has, what has also played a role here is life expectancy has improved because of medical care and technology and just our understanding of diet and, and you know, what we do to ourselves. So all these things are gonna come into play uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens economically because, again, baby boomers are the longest living generation and probably going to be passed by Gen Z, I believe it is. Um, unfortunately, I'm not Gen X, so I'm out of luck. But I've also done some bad things to myself. Uh, but not only are they the longest living, they're the largest. Right, exactly. So it's such a big cohort and they've had such a big effect. So economically when they're not driving you know um a small business or entrepreneurship which is another thing that baby boomers absolutely drove as they got older they said hey you know what maybe i don't need to work for this multinational i'm going to set up my own business i'm going to do my own thing um and think of mcdonald's what does mcdonald's come about in the 50s it's very cropped right so, and it's those sorts of things that really help explode. So here, I think healthcare, I think policy as well. Think of, think of our leaders in government. I wish they were baby boomers. We have some who are baby, and God love them. I hope to get there someday. But you have, you look at our leadership, right? I mean, I said it earlier, when baby boomers average age of 25, they had 10% representation in Congress. That's not the case today because people say forever, right? Doesn't mean they're effective. And it goes back to that statement I made earlier where people say, oh, our government stinks. But my congressman's great, you know, because we just keep voting the same people in. And I'm not advocating that we kick people out, but I think there's got to be a movement for younger people to be more involved in these sorts of things, right? What's one of the most unreliable voting blocks? young people, because they don't feel like they're being listened to, right? What's one of the most reliable? Older people, because they're concerned about social security and, and you know, they're more in tune with, with what's happening politically. So economically, I think healthcare lies. Um, politically, I, I think there's going to be such a drastic change in the, in the next decade to 15 years where, you know, 
you're going to see such such a big change. And my concern is, you know, that we talk about social security, right? And how you've all paid into it, right? And it's it was the work of baby boomers that allowed social security to fly for earlier generations to cover them, to the safety net, right? Well, the concern now is, you know, 79 million of you getting out of the workforce and not that all 79 million will survive, but there's a big number that will need that social security. We don't have it, right? Because it's been spent elsewhere. It's, oh, well, we'll worry about that later. We can use it here. So and I don't think we have, I don't think our current leadership has the, the courage or really the impetus. They talk about it to scare people, but then when push comes to shove, like, we have to make tough decisions. Oh, well, we can wait a few more years. No, we can't. Like, these are the things that have to be addressed now because 2030 is going to be here pretty quickly, right? Um, and these are the sorts of, of issues that, that have to be addressed. I, I've heard this conversation for 40 years. Right. You know, back in the 70s, they kept, you know, they recognized there was a problem with the equations right. for social security. And still, nobody did anything about it. They could have made a little tweak that no one would have ever noticed. Right. But they nobody wanted to be uh, they wanted to be reelected. Right. Well, they call it the third rail for a reason. And that's a, yeah, that's a big rail too. Well, we go back to go back to Gore and Bush in 2000, right? And and Gore and Bush was saying we're gonna take the social security surplus and put it in a, you know, let's let's invest it. And Gore is saying, let's put it in a lockbox. Well, that's gone, right? It's history. It's been spent a thousand times over. So yeah, we we have a lot, and it's going to be fascinating to see. Um, the other thing that you see, so I said earlier, the average family during the baby boom years had 3.77 kids. Um, of course, my family and I was skewed it the other way. Today, that number birth, you know, births are falling in the nation because people are saying, hey, you know what? I can't afford. I have one. I'm one of 11. I have one, right? And most of my, many of my siblings, the most one of my siblings has is four. Of course, not lover. But um, you know, it's just it's just the economic zone. It's the way people look at raising a family now. They say, "Oh my gosh, I can't bring kids into this world. I can't afford it here." So my kids have the same. Um, they say, "Okay, boomer." Right. Oh, yeah. I was, I was going to wear that shirt. They say that to me, and I'm the next to so right. I'm like, I don't blame me. What right. Do you think? Um, but I think that perspective of like when they say things like, well, you could work your way through college, which is not a, you can't do with that anymore. Right. Um, or they say things like, you know, when I was young. Right. Um, and I think there is this real disconnect, which I think is kind of ironic because. You know, they talked about the generation gap between their own parents. Right. But I think this kind of misunderstanding about how, if you're talking about how expensive things are, uh, about, you know, what, in many ways, there were a lot of things given to the boomers. It was easier. Right. Um, and, you know, the Gen X and Gen and Millennial and Gen Z are all facing that they're not going to do as well as they're Right. And that's something. So, you know, we were talking earlier uh, about television. And when television, you know, really takes off. So, 1950, so in 1947, 48, I think there are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2 million TVs in the US. By 1955, half of the American population has a television, it just explodes. Well, what then happens is, so think of the Lone Ranger, the Mickey Mouse Club, you know, Walt Disney. Who are they targeting? Kids. So you go to your, your parents and say, I want a Davy Crockett Coonskin cap, or I want the Red Rider BB, you know, whatever it may be, or I want mouse ears. It's those sorts of things. So, and parents, most parents say, hey, I want my child to have it better than I have it, right? Um, and in some instances, it happens. I know I, now, my daughter would probably disagree, but I feel like we spoil all the rot. Um, but it's just that's what you do as a parent, right? But as baby boomers, you know, your parents, 
were saying, hey, oh my gosh, you're getting hit with all of this stuff. I say, well, my daughter's on TikTok or Facebook or God knows what else she's, she's doing in a room 20 hours a day. Um, but it's just, to your point, Mayor, you know, you're now at the point where younger people are saying, wow, you know what? I may not have it as good as because things are just so out of whack. And over the past few years, it's been pandemic, supply chain issues, inflation, all these other things. People, you know, personally, my work has changed dramatically. I used to have 20 people on my team because we weren't traveling. You know, the powers that be at my company, which in case you're watching, I love you dearly, um, but the powers that be at my company said, we don't need 20 of you, we only need 10 of you. So to what we were talking about before, that employee, employee, employer relationship, it's all bottom line. So, and when you can't afford things, right? Or when you try to think of, I feel bad for people trying to buy a house, right? Think of when you bought your first house, I'm scraped and saved and did everything you could. Housing prices now, I mean, I'm grown as a homeowner that my housing, the price of my house is going through the roof. But how do, how do first time home buyers afford a house? This is crazy amongst other things, right? And again, it's probably another talk for another time, but just the way things have completely changed. So I'm going to stop there. I thank you all for your patience for attending. Any other questions? Any online? No, okay. I just wanted to say one thing. Actually, your talk was excellent and stimulated so many things. My brain is too full. So hopefully I'll be able to speak sure. clearly. Uh, but I, I think the uh, the issue of uh, the workplace now and how it's lost its, you know, I'm in here, my the people who work for me are down the hall, the face to face thing. Right. Oh, I'm concerned that, that that will take its way to um, like world peace and stuff like that. I don't know how many times I've heard them talk about, you know, so-and-so is, is a great uh, secretary of state because they know these people. Right. They, they sit down with them, speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if you don't know who your rival is, Correct. you know, push in the button. You know, it's a lot easier right. than if you know their kids and if your wives, you know, are on committees together or whatever. Absolutely. Like now you, you lose that personal connection. And think of what what uh, Tim O'Neill used to say in the '80s. He said, "Ronald Reagan and I." Thanks for coming. Um, Ronald Reagan and I disagreed on everything, but we would find some common ground and we'd end the day with a glass of scotch at the White House and say, "Here's where we can go with this legislation," rather than. I'm going to make you look like a horse's tattoo right. and, and bury you in the press because we need each other. We have to, you know, and that's that, again, personal might be the, the wrong word, but to your point, you know your adversary, you know what, you, you know their family. There's some sort of connection there rather than, well, I talked to them on the phone, but that's it, right? Over yeah. email. The other thing that struck me basically is with this Ukrainian Russian thing and where, uh, Solinsky, the president, has said that he's worried about the West getting tired of this. And it's kind of like you're, you're, what you said about the news cycle and stuff like that. Right. And when, when he said that, I'm going, what? I, you know, I feel like I would be as interested in your predicament and, and making it better and stuff six months from now, a year from now, that I've heard several people talk. NATO people, you know, Ukrainian right. people talk about, well, we're afraid, you know, the right the, the Americans are gonna tire of this right. and move on and want to move on. Well, and it's short attention span is what it is. People yeah. don't focus on they say, well, you know what? Okay, this Ukrainian thing is a big problem, it's not good, but you know what? There's something over here I'd, I'd rather address. Or, yeah. yeah, something else will come right. up that will. No, I agree with you, and I think, and again, this is why I'm going to sound like a, like you know a complainer, uh, which I probably am. But I think that's also a a, a result of just twenty four seven news, and you know you would think with that they could focus on 
here's what's going on in Ukraine, or here's what's going on with this legislation, here's what's going on with this Supreme Court decision. Everything seems to be so, and, and I don't want to diminish it, but many times it's emotional. They, they're trying to get you hooked emotionally rather than, you know, go back to Woodward and Burns standing the time, saying, here's what we found, here's what we've uncovered. I mean, there are so many things that happen, and I feel the same as you, where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a huge story. It's gone in a day or a week or a month because people get tired of it and they say, all right, what's the next thing? And it's just sad. It's just sad. So thank you thank all. You. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks for attending everyone online. Hopefully,